Hello, hello, welcome back to Bunga Cast, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. My name is Alex Hochuli, I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Next time, could it be different? Could the response to a global pandemic not be authoritarian, but instead authoritative? And what would be the difference between these? This week, Phil and George welcome back on the podcast Shahar Hameri and Tom Choder to talk about their book, the locked up country, as well as Australia's recent indigenous voice referendum. Yep, so we're delighted to be um, joined again um, today by um, Shahar Hamiri, who's a self styled destroyer of dreams, perhaps, but is um, also probably more pertinently for this discussion, Professor of International Politics at the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland, and Tom Chodor, who's uh, who pities the fool with no PhD, maybe, um, Dr. T, but is again more relevantly for what we're going to be discussing today, Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at Monash University. So, hi both, great to see you again. Hey, hey how's it going? Else? Yeah, good. Um, cool. Brilliant. So, yeah, the first thing that we wanted to just um, talk through, because obviously we're going to be going through your book, The Locked Up uh, Country, as the main thing we're discussing. But there's been a referendum in Australia recently. Um, yeah, the voice referendum. Could you just talk us through this a little bit? Is this um, Australia's Brexit moment, as some have styled it? Um, mm. So I guess I can get started and give you give a bit of insight what the Brexit or sorry, what the voice referendum was and then see if Shahar has some insights into what it actually meant. But so this was a referendum for that was proposing a constitutionally enshrined indigenous advisory body called the voice um, into the constitution that would give non-binding advice to the government on indigenous matters. So um, this came out of a, a series of dialogues and sort of meetings between different um, Indigenous groups, Indigenous um, social movements and NGOs and so on. Um, and their idea was to propose this this sort of alteration to the Constitution, first formally recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution, and then also to um, set up this body um, that would then give advice to the government in order how to address Indigenous disadvantage. Um, right. So we went through a referendum re- very recently, a couple of weeks ago, and it failed, basically. So the result was 60% no to 40% yes, um, and also it failed in every single state, um, aside from the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, which is a territory right in the state. Um, so it was roundly rejected. Um, and there's been obviously a lot of, lot of debate, a lot of discussion about why why that was. Um, you know, the Brexit moment is one of the, one of the, the views on it, but I think, you know, it's, it's not really our area of expertise, um, this topic, but we've been looking at it, obviously, as observers in- interested in Australian politics. And I think some of the things that st- stood out for us was, firstly, just general indifference. This was just not a topic, yeah. not, a, not a proposal that really motivated people, that really um, that, that really got them excited um, or got them angry, really. I mean, there, was, you know, there, were, there were campaigns, but most people literally, you know, leading up to the Ribbit referendum didn't know what it was about. Um, especially with pre tough economic times in Australia, like everywhere else. Um, the, the campaign for it was um, very poor, the Yes campaign. It was very much a top-down, corporate-driven campaign um, that refused to provide any details of what this voice would entail, how it would be constructed, um, because that was all to be tied by Parliament. But they sort of made a virtue out of saying, look, we're not going to burden you with burden you the details. Yeah. Just, just vote for reconciliation. Just vote on the vibe, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, and if you disagree, then you, you're probably a racist or at least on the wrong side of history. There was also a division within the indigenous community itself. There was a small but very loud and active um, no campaign against the voice from the indigenous community, both from the conservative side who sort of didn't want to alter the constitution and didn't really think it was necessary to address indigenous issues. And also from the sort of far left side, which saw it as a compromise with the settler state. Um, that's something that should be avoided. Um, undoubtedly, there was a bit of racism involved. This is still an, an, an issue in Australia, but I don't th- we don't think it was a major issue that really played part in the voice. Um, and the broader point, and I guess this is where Shahar can come in and sort of give you 
give you his Brexit take is I think there was a general suspicion of elite projects and, and elite motivations that were not really sold to people. They were not really sold to the population. This was something that was seen as coming out of, you know, out of, out of, out of the political class, out of the NGO class. And most people couldn't make sort of tales of what it was to do with their lives. And, you know, we're basically asked to trust politicians and we know how well that ends. So mm. Shahad, do you want to yeah. build on that? Yeah, so um, on the Brexit question, the interesting thing is that both uh, the yes and no, both the left and right, by and large, wanted to claim this as some kind of a Brexit moment. So the on the on the losing side, um, basically um, there was a barrage of commentary talking about how this was. Uh, they came out both before, but mostly after the result. That was talking about, you know, how it reflected. Um, like Brexit Britain, you know, the the kind of uh, underlying racism that's prevalent in the community or, or the narrow-mindedness of the voting public and, and so on. And, and a lot of that uh, was put in terms that kind of was, was suspicious of, of, of the wider public, you know, that they're incapable of making the right kind of decisions. But then also on the right, there were some people that wanted to claim this as some kind of... Uh, a moment of popular sovereignty, uh, a moment where mm. people got together and said no to these kind of elite agendas and so on. I don't think either of them is quite right. Um, I think that there are some similarities with the Brexit moment um, in the UK, but I think these similarities can only go a certain uh, distance. So the similarities are basically you have a situation where, as I mentioned before, there was there was a very similar reaction uh, among the people who wanted the the, the yes result um, to what you got in Britain from the Remainers, in a sense that they turn a question of politics into a question of morality. Um, I think that similarity is very much uh, there, as Tom uh, explained in a few moments ago. Um, and, and I think that the language in which um, the yes campaign was trying to convince people to vote um, and reacted to it was very similar. Um, on the other hand, and I think that's a really big difference is that political mainstream in Australia was itself split over this uh, referendum, right. which is very different from the Brexit referendum. So the Brexit mm. referendum, you had two major parties basically backing Remain. And there are a few renegade members of parliament out there, you know, and, and they're the ones that um, combined with this um, you know, popular sovereignty moment or whatever you want to call it, um, carried the, uh, the leave vote. Here, you had the major party, the Liberal Party, actually backing the no vote, um, which is really quite different uh, because it is a major party. Um, it, it's, it's got a lot of supporters and, and it's out there. It's very public. Um, so to that extent, and in Australia, there's never been a referendum that passed without the support of both major parties, never in history. So that alone right. should have been enough to, to tell people that there's something um, something up. Um so given that it's hard to see there's a kind of two fingers up to the establishment as, as the Brexit vote perhaps could be seen in the UK. Um, and I think really what it shows us more than anything else uh, is really this, uh, um, what Tom was describing before, this political indifference um, towards this particular referendum. So this idea that this could be yeah. mobilized towards something else. Um, there are a lot of people talking about how the far right is really gained from this and this is an indication that far-right views are widespread in Australia and so on. I don't buy that. I actually don't see any kind of significant increase in far-right votes. In fact, many of the people that voted no, the same people that voted for the Labour Party just recently, mm. um, and many of them remain Labour supporters. They just didn't like this particular proposal. A lot of them didn't really understand it and didn't really care enough about it to, to, to understand it. Um so arguably, if it tells us anything that maybe has some relationship to Brexit or that really speaks to politics today more generally, is really this this void that exists between you know the people in, in politics and, mm. and the rest of society, because they clearly cared about this a lot. They thought about it a lot. Yeah. Um, they really, you know, the elites and a lot is. of time. Sorry. <laughs> So the elites that is cared about this a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, they cared about it a lot. Uh, also in the media, there was a lot of reporting about it, but the wider part of it just didn't care enough. Um, so I think that's maybe uh, maybe something that's peculiar to our moment, but it's not really like Brexit. I think people really cared about Brexit in, in Britain. I think that's quite different. It's a very, it's a very helpful breakdown, Shahar. And I guess I, so I wanted to ask you 
you, both of you then, was there a way for the, what was there ever a path to victory for the voice referendum? Was there something they could have done that they, that might have won them the referendum or was it, you know, was it actually set up to fail in a sense? Hmm. I, th- I think that um, that's a very good question, um, and o- obviously uh, hy- um, counterfactual um, are always very difficult. Um, I think that the way that it was set up, it was always destined to fail, uh, because it was um, it, it it put forward a, a very complicated uh, proposal uh, that had different elements that required people to um, get behind uh, aspects of constitutional reform that we're not particularly clear to them the rationale for for these reforms um and it it maybe demonstrates a genuine lack of care about indigenous issues in this country but uh, perhaps if the indigenous community itself mobilized cohesively around that maybe there was um you know greater impetus elsewhere to um um to vote yes because uh, we know that in 1967 when the referendum to include indigenous people uh, among the uh, you know the Australian citizens uh, was held, uh, the support then was about ninety percent. Um, so it's hard to imagine that the ca- country has gone more racist in the last uh, fifty odd years than it did in the nineteen sixties. I think also um, yeah, at the start of the year, support for the referendum was over sixty percent. Um, so, sorry, support for the voice was over sixty percent. So I think we can't take away from the train wreck of the campaign, which actually the more people started talking about them campaigning for the voice the less the the population became in favour of it. Um, And also quite a successful no campaign from led by the Liberal Party, uh, sort of the opposition, which was, you know, the slogan was, if you don't know, vote no kind of thing. Um, So I think, you know, the the, the goodwill was possibly there if people could be taken along on a journey. But the political class, I think, was not really, was frightened of that. And part of it is the sort of the, the general malaise that we see at the end of the end of history. Uh, part of it is is historical memory of the 1999 um, Republic referendum in Australia, where there was a, a Republic model proposed that people voted on and overwhelmingly rejected, even though the majorities were in favour of Australia becoming a Republic. So that sort of has scarred the political class to to you know to to be conditioned not to want to frighten the horses. Basically, you know we can't tell voters too much detail because they're not capable enough of. Are voting right. it and our opponents will basically use that all that knowledge against us so they made a conscious decision not to say have a legislation ready that says if this wins this is what we put forward to parliament and parliament can negotiate whether we agree on what how the because the whole thing was a parliament was supposed to be sovereign and de- determine how the voice would work but the government refused to release any legislation and say anything about how it would work saying well after the referendum of successful then we'll put forward some legislation so i think if they trusted people and said look this is what we're going to do um, if if they had a better campaign that was actually more grassroots. I think as Shahar said, if the indigenous um, community was not split, even though the split wasn't, you know, 50-50, but it just created more doubt when there was some very prominent indigenous actors against it, then there probably would have been a, a better chance of, of it passing, as well as had we not just, you know, living through an inflation crisis and the cost of living crisis. And I think a lot of people sort of thought that this was a, you know, the government should be focusing on fixing that rather than pushing ambitious right. constitutional reform. There are also some deep contradictions in the idea itself, in a sense that on the one hand, and the, the no campaign capitalized on them uh, to, to a great extent, because on the one hand, the supporters were saying, this is only an advisory body. It will not have any binding powers over government on the one hand. On the other hand, it was portrayed as the thing that's going to resolve many of the really significant problems that uh, affect many Indigenous people in Australia. Um, so people didn't really see how this worked with that. Um, and, and I think the no campaign um, said it again and again, and, and they put them in the corner um, that they couldn't really get out mm. of. Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah, really helpful because I think we have seen a few. Um, it would be nice, I think, um, from my perspective, at least if it was a Brexit moment. Um, but we do sometimes get criticised on this podcast for just talking about Brexit and lockdown all the time so we go on to our next topic of discussion which is uh lockdown um no it's your i mean it is partly that but it's your book the locked up country learning the lessons from australia's covid19 response um yeah i think phil you had a a question that you wanted to throw in right at the start 
Well, only only off the back of um, what you were just saying, George. So I know it's frustrating to some of our listeners, um, a proportion of our listeners, that we um, of our focus on lockdown over the since lockdown ended. Um, and I, th- I suppose there, you know, I mean, I I don't wish to put words in their mouth, but you know, kind of, I suppose. Uh, a kind of a straw poll sample or an unrepresentative sample of their frustrations, I think, would go something like this. It would be that, um, you know, lockdown is in the past. There are many kind of bad things happening at the moment. Mistakes might have been made, but, you know, something had to be done. So this kind of constant raking over the experience of lockdown or um, drawing attention to it, uh, to the period of lockdown, um, you know, it doesn't, what purpose does it really serve? So I suppose I wanted to put that frustration to um, to you guys, because it's another way of asking um, what prompted you to write the book? Why do you think it's important that we do have a retrospective on lockdown at this particular time? Well, I think the first thing to note is that we started writing the book during lockdown. Um, It's just some of us, i.e. me, are slower writers than Shahar, so the book's taken a bit longer um, to get out than we wanted it to. Um, But I think, look, we've we've written a book. Admittedly, it would have been nice if it came out about a year ago where lockdown and COVID was still um, uh, more pressing and more more sort of recent developments. But the reason we we wrote the book is, you know, I live in Melbourne, which was the world is still is the world's lockdown capital. You know, we spent 262 days in lockdown. So I, I felt it quite viscerally and quite strongly. You know, Shahar lives in Queensland, which had about three days of lockdown throughout the whole pandemic, give or take. But he was, you know, he was of a belief that he will be in lockdown in any any day, um, you know, any any day coming. So we talked about this a lot, especially as I was locked down and he wasn't. Um, and large parts of that time was when the rest of the country was open and free. So it's sort of a lot of, there's a lot of talk about Australia is doing great. Australia has made a major success story, you know, compared to the, the dumpster fire that was the UK at the time or the US or at least perceived as so Europe, everywhere else, Australia managed to sort of to, to clock, clock, clock COVID. You know, we bet it, aside from those, you know, silly Victorians um, in, in Melbourne who couldn't seem to figure out what they were doing. Um, but Shahar and I were talking and, you know, um, we're saying this is not, that's not the story. And you know, the story is surely is not a success story. And we'll get into why we, we argue for that because that becomes, you know, our initial motivation for the book is to push back against that success story narrative um, and actually say, no, look, we got lucky. We got lucky in a number of ways. And if we don't, if we don't catch on to that, if we don't realize that, then that luck will run out. And you know, as we started writing the book, mm-hmm. that luck started running out and, you know, half of the country ended up in lockdown. It wasn't just a Victoria or Melbourne thing. Um, so that sort of that drove us even further to say, look, we need to explain why we've ended up in this situation, um, because you know, one, it's we're not a success story; uh, we've just been lucky. And two, if we just coast on our luck for the future, then the next time there's a crisis, whether it's another pandemic or something else, we're not we might not be as lucky. You know, we will not. Uh, you know, we, we might not be the type of crisis that we can just close our borders on and lock everyone in their houses for. So unless we draw some lessons out of this, then we're not going to, you know, we, the next crisis is not going to be as kind of us. Um, and I think, you know, even though the crisis has passed, I mean, pandemics passed and lockdowns are you know, mostly forgotten now, to some extent, I think those lessons that we arrive at, that analysis, I think, of, of how we ended up in the situation are even more important now than they were um, during the pandemic if possible. They're certainly as important. Mm. Um, because Australia's capacity to to deal with crisis, to deal with um, um, issues that arise out of unexpectedly, is still very poor. And you know, we can talk about later about how how represented that is of the rest of the world. Um, but mm. but we think you know we think this is a story that's not just an Australian story, and it's not a story just about COVID, but actually a story for the future. Um, Shah, do you have anything to add? Um, not in particular. Um, I would I would just say that. Um, we actually talk in the book about the parallels between the crisis that the, the, the book is mostly about, which is the COVID crisis and other crises that happened in Australia more recently, like the floods crisis that happened uh, last year, yeah. where parts of New South Wales, um, which were flooded, were basically left to fend for themselves for, for a week. Uh, I mean, that's just an indication that some of the problems that uh, that we bring up in, in the COVID story, which are to some extent unique to that particular pandemic, but they demonstrate a deeper problem 
Um, and, and lockdown is a manifestation of that problem because the reason that Australia was in lockdown for such a long time and sadly Melbourne is because we couldn't seem to figure out a better way of dealing with it. Um, so we just kept yeah. going back. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a sign, as people said, I, I think our, a good friend Lee Jones said that, it's a sign of state failure um, when, when you get that repeated lurch into lockdown. Yep. Yeah, great. I mean, I think that's that's it, right? And it does it does come through in the book that like, is next time going to be different? Well, there's a flood, and you have people kind of going on Facebook, calling up people with with like kayaks to go and rescue people off their roofs and that sort of thing. So it is a you know this is it is a very clear example of of um, the pathologies of the regulatory state, which is a phrase that you use, and we'll come come through to that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm probably a bit biased <laughs> in the sense that I, you know, I tended to think that COVID and lockdown was, you know, was a, a big deal and something that, that is worth analyzing even after, after the event. But Tom, to go to your, you kind of mentioned this 262 days, um, <clears throat> being locked down in Melbourne or 45% of the time between March, 2020 and the end of the last lockdown in October, 2021. Um, how was that? Did you enjoy just catching up on TV, having some, Deliveroo or whatever the Australian equivalent is and you know just um recharging the batteries or was it a little bit more tricky than that oh absolutely I learned to do all sorts of things um not at all um sourdough do some no sourdough baking <laughs> um, I, I'll leave it for you to figure out who the sourdough baker is amongst the two of us here um some of us were actually in lockdown whereas the others just are cosplaying it um look I think you know, I, I, I've written on this before about, you know, actually sort of a, what, what is it like to live in, you know, world's lockdown capital? Um, and there's, there's no two words about it. It was crap. It was it was pretty alienating and pretty rage-inducing at various times, especially because, you know, it wasn't just one long lockdown for 262 two days. It was six of them. And they kept happening again and again. And you sort of thought, well, we're, you know, I thought we finally cracked this. I thought we've learned some lessons, but no, here we go again. Um, I had, you know, that that scene from um, uh, from that TV show, um, Twin Peaks, isn't it? Um, you know, it is happening again, um, playing in my head whenever this, uh, when, whenever we went back into lockdown. But you know, it was a very strict lockdown. We can talk later about how strict Australia's lockdowns were. But you know, I I couldn't go more than five kilometres from my house. I could only leave home um, once a day to go shopping if I had to. Um, I could only exercise once a day. You know, everything was closed. Uh, only cafes were open for takeaway food. So every morning I'd walk to the same cafe, talk to the cafe owner who was you know, basically at the verge of despair about you know how we was going to keep the business going and then walk back home and that was it. That was my entertainment for the day. Um, so that was, you know, it was quite alienating, you know, especially with this you know, travel distance. You couldn't go and see your friends. You couldn't go see um, family or anything like that. Um, and then the rest of the country was open. The rest of the country was was fine for large parts of that, which, and, you know, that was sort of, it was a weird feeling where everyone else was just living, you know, living life back to normal. Whereas I was sitting here, you know, just sort of being pissed off that no one really understood what we were going through, but neither did we really understand what normal was like because we'd seemed like mm. we'd been locked down forever. Um, and then, yeah, as this kept repeating itself, that sort of alienation turned to, to anger or to, you know, pretty strong frustration because, I couldn't believe that it kept happening again. Um, and, you know, that we hadn't learned the lessons that other other parts of the country hadn't learned the lessons that, that we were experiencing. Um, but yes, overall, I think the experience was quite quite alienating. I actually moved out of the, the suburb that I lived in because I was so sick of it after two years of, you know, walking every single green space within five yeah. kilometers of it, of my house. Yeah. Uh, I've moved to the beach, which is a, a, a vast improvement. Um, and you know, I don't, uh, I no longer feel like going to the shops is a, is a treat, but for a long time it was, you know, that one trip to the shops a week was actually an exciting chance to get out of the house. Um, especially as you know, mm -hmm. my wife works, um, as a, as a psychologist, so she was deemed an essential worker. So she continued going to work as normal where I just sat around home with myself and mostly, you know, did work and bitched and moaned to Shahar. Um, and this is how this, this the story started basically. Hmm. I mean, also, also sad that academics are not deemed essential workers. I think that's that is um, a, a harsh judgment. No, they were, on... they were in the UK, not in Australia though. But they we were, were the yeah. most essential workers you could imagine. We were shut down before everyone else was shut down. 
But then the Australian Parliament um, was also, as we say in the book, uh, all of the parliaments uh, were also shut down for quite a long time. So that wasn't an essential service either. Yeah, no, it's um, in the UK as well. There was definitely a, um, yeah, it, it showed you what the politicians kind of thought of their of their role of um, of governing, perhaps you could say. But um, no, I think that it is just helpful to to go through that kind of experience. I mean, listeners who have who did experience lockdown themselves will have their own memories, um, <clears throat> either positive or negative of of this. But I think you know it's an extreme example. Obviously, the most lockdown place, but it gives um, you know some of the essential truth of what of what this what these um, social policies were were like. Um, so the book itself is is framed on you know to jump from that particularly unlucky sounding experience to yeah the the riff of the the book is the on the lucky country, which is Donald Horn's 1964 book, which um, you know this is this is the description of Australia. And we talked um, previously on episode f- um, three f- five seven. Um, in August, lucky meaty nations um, about why Australia was a lucky country, um, eating a lot of meat, um, having barbecues and, you know, living living the dream. Um, but could you just recap this for listeners who might have missed that uh, that episode? Like why why did Horn think that Australia was a lucky country? Um, who was it who did the research into Australian meat consumption? And just uh, yeah, give us give us a bit of the the background as to why Australians might consider themselves to live in the lucky country. <laughs> okay, so we we call it the locked up country, uh, and it's a riff on, the, as you said, a very famous book by Donald Horn, the lucky country, which many people use as Australia's sort of unofficial tagline. Uh, but what many people don't know, um, but anyone who had read who, who read the book would know, is that he used it ironically. He didn't actually in, uh, mean that Australia was exactly a lucky country but it was a lucky country that didn't deserve its luck because it was run by second-rate people both in politics uh, but also in business and a number of other areas Uh, and these people just coasting on the country's luck. Uh, The country Mm -hmm. was lucky because it was settled in a very particular way that made it very prosperous um, and that had a prosperity that was relatively widely shared uh, but he said, writing in the 1960s, I don't think this is going to last unless we actually get serious and stop just running on luck here. Um, and the funny thing about it is that as famous as that book is and you know how iconic it is in Australia, both of us read that book for the first time actually during the pandemic. Um, and um, because it's one of those books, it's, it's always there, but you don't actually bother reading it. But we actually read it. Um, And we started to think, actually, the similarities are really quite striking here because Mm -hmm. Australia got very lucky at the start of of, of the pandemic uh, for reasons that we can discuss in a moment. But that luck pretty soon ran out because it was run by second rate people. Things were happening that were, you know, just not not really um, in in any way functional, but because... um, the, the initial intervention managed to somehow uh, eliminate the the virus. A lot of and, and then lockdowns came in. A lot of that was papered over. So this is something that we wanted to bring out. Um, and this is uh, basically how we sort of uh, ended up with our title for the book. Um, so it's not just an attempt to somehow uh, ride on on Horn's uh, very large coat uh, coattails. It's it's actually something that speaks to the pandemic experience more specifically. Hmm. No, I think, uh, and the reference to to meaty countries, listeners can go back to that um, to that episode to hear about <clears throat> mid century Australian or early twentieth century Australian meat consumption. Um, but yeah, so Tom, just to to I guess build out on this a, a little bit, was um, Australia's COVID policy a success? I think a lot of people around the world did look um, to Australia, to New Zealand, and think, ah, you know, this is this is the way to do it. Just kind of draw the um draw the drawbridge up and and everything will be fine so was this another success for the quote-unquote lucky country well i think yes i think you're right george a lot of people still seem to think so um and i guess at the start it seemed like that might have been the case because you know we did pull up the drawbridges um we very quickly um relatively quickly eliminated all community transmission of covid because most of our cases were actually imported from overseas so shutting the border down um, and, you know, keeping out um, people coming from overseas ended up doing a lot of the hard work to actually eliminate the virus together with a sort of the first national coordinated lockdown 
as the rest of the world was going through them, you know, in the sort of from March to May 2020. Um, that, you know, initially that was done for similar reasons to the rest of the world to flatten the curve. Um, but here it actually worked better than that. It actually literally eliminated the virus. Um, and that's where the success story came from. So the argument was that, you know, that Australian leaders listened to advice, that, you know, they followed medical advice, they did the right thing. They didn't dither, they didn't, you know, do Trumpian levels of, um, you know, speculating about um, various cures and whatnot. They just did what had to be done. And as a result of that, the rest of the country and the whole country could live uh, you know, a relatively normal um, you know, normal life while the, you know, the rest of the world burns. Now, um, we felt that that was actually, as, as I mentioned earlier, that was a very bad reading of the situation. Um, but initially, we we're not really, you know, this was not really a popular view. We really drank our Kool-Aid in Australia as well that, you know, we had managed to solve this. We had managed to somehow, you know, succeed um, where no one else or hardly anyone else did. Um, but actually, you know, what our argument became in the book that, you know, that our, our initial success relied on two very simple things, which was lockdowns and border closures. Um, and these were, you know, not enlightened policy measures, but actually pretty blunt and pretty simple policies that we, that Australia could implement because it wasn't capable of, of implementing any more complicated policies, any more uh, sophisticated policies. And we saw this because whenever the virus would get back into the country, we kept relying on those, you know, doing another lockdown, trying to close the border down further, um, trying to do the simple things because we didn't couldn't do any of the more complicated things. So um, we argue in the book, and we can talk about that um, how you know, in more detail, how every sophisticated um, policy failed in Australia, which mm -hmm. led us back to lockdowns, back to border closures, which became less and less effective as the virus evolved, as it became more infectious, um, yeah. as the population grew tired of being in lockdown. Um, so that's how we became the locked up country. That's sort of how we arrived at, at, you know, at that title, that actually you know, we're not the lucky country. With a country that just locked down and eventually that stopped working and that stopped being mm -hmm. successful um so yeah and in the book also, we yeah also the failures of, of the you know i think this the book makes this really clear the failure failures of other other policies um and you know that's that's something we yeah talk about in a minute <laughs> One of the key arguments in the book is that the failures of Australia's handling of COVID wasn't down to individual politicians' shortcomings or the um, unprecedented, unexpected so-called black swan aspect of COVID. Um, it seems so your central thesis is that really this all went wrong because the state in Australia has lost its capacity to govern in the decades prior to the pandemic, um, which sounds like an, an extraordinary thing to say. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk us through the history of that process a bit, and in particular, what you call the regulatory state, the movement to the regulatory state. How has the Australia, Australian state transformed from the 70s to the 2020s and, and why? Yeah, thanks. Uh, look, I mean, firstly, just to clarify, I don't think that individual leaders don't matter at all. I think that there are circumstances in which they can make a real difference. Um and, you know, we go back to Mark's famous um, uh, expression from uh, the 18th Brumaire that, you know, men make history, but et cetera, et cetera, not in conditions of their own making. Uh, so there are ways in which a better leader, say, in Canberra could have made a positive difference. Um, but at the same time, yes, I mean, there were significant constraints on what any leader could have done at the time. And the legacy of those problems goes back quite a long way. The story that I'm going to tell very quickly, uh, which we tell in the book, actually is a very familiar story. Uh, it, it, it resonates with the experience of almost every Western country over that period of the post-war, sort of the, 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 the move from the post-war Keynesian sort of welfare state uh, through neoliberalism into the regulatory state. It's not a uniquely Australian story. Although, of course, in every country, it looks a little bit different. Um, and it happened here as well. So basically, just to kind of have a, a quick recap, um, like many yeah. other countries at the end of World War II, uh, Australian government and the state more generally developed some very substantial capacities and was largely organized in a kind of hierarchical command and control way. 
Um, and these capacities, which were developed during the war, um, and we talk in the book about some of the really incredible things that, that were done here uh, as part of the war effort, um, these capacities were then repurposed for peace. You know, So they're redirected towards uh, many of the, again, very similar uh, objectives in other countries of achieving full employment uh, and of beginning to deliver uh, a growing range of, of services, including social services to the population. This was also a time of very rapid migration into Australia, not just from Britain anymore, but from also other parts of the world increasingly. Um, and the government uh, was playing its part in, in actually absorbing these people into Australia. Uh, it, it you know, created capacities to build housing in many cases and, and a whole bunch of different things. Um, and again, this is, this is not unusual, but that's the country that Donald Horne talks about when he talks about the lucky country in his book, it was that country in the 1960s. Um, and yeah. it, it was a, a remarkable success story. The economic growth rates in the 50s and 60s were around the kind of 5 to 6% in Australia throughout most of those years. So it was a very, very rapidly growing economy. Um, and because of the um, redistribution, uh, mainly through high wages that existed here, Many people gained from uh, very high economic growth. Um, the country suburbanized, um, like the United States, uh, quality of, of living was very high and so on. But again, like in many other countries, we get to the 1970s uh, and things go pear-shaped in Australia. Uh, we get a very substantial stagflation crisis here, um, probably one of the worst in the world. Uh, we have this um, kind of factoid in the book that the OECD ran what they call a misery index at the time. Um, and Australia was ranked in 1983, which is a, a sp towards the end of that cycle, uh, as the second worst in the OECD in terms of the, the, the misery index, which was about unemployment and, um, and, and economic, very low levels of economic growth at the time. It suffered from five recessions in 10 years. Uh, industrial conflict returned in a big way in the 1970s. It was relatively muted in the 50s and 60s, but uh, workers were going on strikes, um, demanding higher pay. Um, th that was actually in Australia, that's a peculiarly strange situation. It was worsened by the so-called dismissal, uh, which was uh, the time in 1975 when the Governor General, who is the representative of the Queen, at the time the Queen in Australia, dismissed the uh, government um, uh, and and uh, basically forced an election. Um, so it was a very tense time politically in this country. Now, again, not uniquely Australian, but elites in this country from both political parties actually saw the crisis as a crisis of an overburdened state. They came to the conclusion that too much was promised. This is a little bit like yeah. what... Kel was talking about in his book, Broken Promises, which is a brilliant book. And I know that you talked about that on the podcast. Too many promises were made. These promises could not be kept. The state was overburdened. Too many people were asking for too many things. They had too many expectations. Something had to be done yeah. about that. Um, and again, uh, this uh, linked up with um, the agenda of the Trilateral Commission, which we talk about, um, and, and similar moves around the Western world at the time. Um, and we know this is a, quite an interesting story that Bob Hawke, who became Australian Prime Minister in the 1980s, he was the Labour Prime Minister. He was uh, the main union leader in the 1970s, which was that period of industrial strife. Uh, but it was later revealed that he had regular meetings with the American Embassy um, in Australia. And in those meetings, he was telling the Americans, this is at the same time that he was parading himself in the media as, uh, as a working class hero, he was telling the Americans that, no, the business is right. Workers are asking too much. Something needs yeah. to be done. So he, we, we say in the book that his heart was never really in it because this is what was happening at the same time as he was supposedly fighting the workers' corner. So the solution, is, as, as in, again, many other countries, uh, to uh, making the economy work again, making capital great again, if you like, um, and to uh, kind of overcome this crisis was to, if, if the state was overburdened, if it was, listening too much to what people wanted, especially from the bottom up, the solution was to make it less responsive in, in a variety of different ways and also to convince people basically not to expect too much from, from the government, from the state. So how did they do that? So the first thing, and this is a slightly uniquely Australian story, 
Um, we know that in the UK and the US, uh, it was the right, the new right that introduced neoliberalism. Australia and New Zealand, actually, are the first third way countries. They're the first countries that introduced neoliberalism by the center left, by the Labour Party. Uh, so the Labour Party came to power in 1983 uh, after being in opposition for about eight years. Uh, it was led by Bob Hawke. Um, and essentially what they did, they used Hawke's connections with the union movement because he was previously the head of the unions to uh, put together this thing called the Accord, which was an agreement whereby the unions agreed and the unions were a little bit exhausted at that point because uh, they were fighting industrial conflict uh, was, was, as I said, very, very bad for, for a number of years at that point. So they, they essentially agreed for wage moderation and to, to keep a lid on strikes and so on. In exchange, the promise was that the social wage would be increased dramatically. And that was the deal. We know in hindsight that many of the more progressive elements of the accords were not actually implemented, but the unions were brought under control. And as a result, um, their power basically collapsed. So Australia was one of the most heavily unionized countries in the world at, at, at the time. In the 1970s, participation rate in unions was over 50%. Now it's about 14%. And if you look at private sector unions, it's, it's much lower than that. Um, so that was the beginning of it. But then many reforms followed. Um, and while many people, when they talk about neoliberalism, talk about it as if there's some kind of naive commitment to free markets, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was an element there. But we think that the most important aspect of it was this thing that I mentioned before, making the state less responsive, making people believe that the state will do less for them. And that took a variety of forms here, as it did in many other countries, which we talk about in the book. So firstly, um, unelected agencies were given a lot of power. Uh, and the classic case for that, of course, is the Reserve Bank of Australia, which was notionally independent before, but it was made properly independent in the 1990s. Uh, but it was kind of a, le uh, a process leading up to yeah. that. Uh, but he wasn't the only one. There are a number of other uh, similar agencies that got a lot of power to, uh, to make some pretty important decisions. Um, another element of it was the outsourcing of implementation um, uh, and, and policy development. So implementation, outsourcing, everyone knows about, but Australia is world leading in consulting. Um, and, and that's an, an example of outsourcing of policymaking. Um, and that, again, allows government to say, well, we consulted the experts and that's what they told us. Um, so that's that's another mm -hmm. element of putting an arm's length between government uh, and the public. There was also a lot of privatization here um, at, at both levels of government, both uh, federal and states. Service delivery has been marketized, which allows government to say, well, we didn't do anything wrong. It was a particular provider that that is the problem. Um, and something that may, may not be familiar to listeners in non-federal countries, but in Australia, it also took the form of uh, what uh, we, we didn't use that term, but we didn't create the term, but we used it, regulatory federalism, which is a shift from federalism as devolution, meaning that governments just divide the roles and each one does what he does, to a situation where the federal government essentially becomes like the regulator of state governments. And that operates mainly through networks. So they don't interact as governments anymore. They interact as networks of public servants and NGOs and consultants and others that are working. So this is this areas. is the regulatory state. That yeah. So that is exactly what the regulatory state looks like. So government doesn't do anything directly anymore. Uh, anything is an exaggeration. If there's still defense, there's a number of other areas where it retains that top-down capacity. But in most areas of government, the way that policy happens is via trying to kind of steer, coax, convince, incentivize a very wide range of agencies to do what the government wants them to do. But the goals are yeah. definitely, in most cases, are set in fairly broad terms. We're not talking about uh, a political project that has clear goals, that harnesses the capacity of the state towards achieving these goals. This is a fairly kind of loose system that tries to bring together these different elements to make something happen. And, and that's the regulatory mm. state uh, that we talk about in the book. Yeah, no, thanks. I think I, it, it's a really important transition um, and it comes through really clearly in the in the book. I mean, I, I definitely found it to be, you know, a really succinct kind of history of this, this transition from the 70s 
to the to the to the 2020s um broadly but yeah so i mean you know, kind of pu- pulling all this together on the eve of like covid so early 2020s what's what what was the state that australians found themselves uh, having so yeah i think i think the first thing that we, we we want to draw your attention to before we talk about the state of australia the country i think what we then having identified the regulatory state we talk about the pathologies that it creates because that created the situation yeah. where we responded to covid so badly so because of the sort of things that Shahar talked about, because we've outsourced service delivery, because we've privatized, because we've, uh, politicians have handed decision-making power to these unelected bodies or outsourced to consultants, um, the regulatory state, that's sort of the, the, the label for all of that, that sort of move to remove the state from society, creates a number of pathologies that then haunt any sort of government dis- um, decision-making process, and especially during COVID. So... We, we talk about a number of these pathologies and sort of the most, I guess, the most obvious one, the most basic one is that the regulatory state undermines state capacity for direct action. So basically, um, the state often is incapable of actually acting directly. When something happens, you know, the leader can't just say, we need to do something about this. I'm going to pull this lever and this is going to happen. They often pull the lever and there's nothing there. There's no capacities um, yeah. that they have in order to act. Um it's also created, it sort of blurred the lines of control responsibility. So basically, because governance has become such a mishmash of various regulatory bodies, various states and, and, and government uh, bodies, experts, consultancies, and so on, it's hard to know who's in charge and whether they actually have the capacity to act to you know to, to live up to their responsibilities. Um, and that's something that you guys will probably find quite familiar. Um, yeah, so just, just, just on this, because I think uh, one of the... Um lines that that you that you kind of quote is um about i don't hold a syringe mate could you like this is a kind of could you just explain this a little bit because you know you talked about this kind of blurred lines of control and responsibility you know this this means everybody can point the finger at somebody else Mm -hmm. for being responsible for being accountable to, to this what is the who it's a particularly australian kind of way of putting it but like who was not holding syringes mate and why were they not well, I mean, that's um, that, that's a, it's an amusing story, I guess. Um, so the, the the line is a tribute was wasn't a tribute, but was a description of the attitude of Scott Morrison, who was a prime minister during the pandemic, of his attitude towards um, the vaccination rollout, which was a complete mess in Australia, and so basically put us back at least six months behind other comparable nations when it came to reaching our vaccination targets. But the line itself sort of summarizes, as you say, this 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 regulatory state attitude of well, I'm not responsible, someone else someone else is responsible for actually doing things. But the line refers to Scott Morrison just before COVID. Australia, you may remember, we had a pretty pretty crappy summer before COVID hit in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it was known as the Black Summer of Bushfires, where 24 million hectares of land were burned across three states over many months. The three people lost their lives, 3,000 homes are lost, 1 billion animals are estimated to have been killed during these fires. You know, large um, a lot of the main cities on the eastern seaboard were you know, basically you know, covered in smoke for days and months on the end, and you know, respiratory problems arising and so on. It was a pretty bad summer, and throughout that whole process, in the middle of that whole process, um, Prime Minister Scott Morrison decided to go on holiday to Hawaii and didn't tell anyone about it, um, and basically tried to his office tried to cover up the fact he was out of the country. Um, and then pictures came up of people taking pictures of themselves with him in Hawaii and posting on Facebook and Twitter and so on and became a scandal. And so he had to sort of rush back to Australia to sort of sit to be seen to be, you know, like in charge and sort of seem to be taking control of the situation. And he did a radio interview where someone sort of, you know, the, sort of the host confronted him about that saying, look, why are you going on holiday when the country's burning? And he was like, well, you know, I think the I think uh, Scott Morrison said I think the Australian people know that I don't hold a hose, mate. I'm not the one who's actually out there putting out the fire. So why would I be here? Mm. Um, so that sort of that phrase came to haunt him for months and you know into the COVID pandemic because it was seen as an encapsulation of him shirking responsibility of him being indifferent and callous to people's plight. He then tried to tour some of these um, um some of these areas which got burnt out and shake hands of people. People refused to shake his hands and yelled and screamed at mm. him and sort of cursed him and so on. So that phrase followed him. And then the pandemic initially you know, gave him a, a popularity boost like all of the other politicians. Um, but once once things started unraveling, people returned to that phrase and said, actually, 
Scott Morrison is, is is the problem here. He's the guy who refuses to take responsibility. He refuses to to be across the detail and to be sure that you know that that that, that government is on, on the on the job. But our, our yeah. argument is that you know it's not just a Scott Morrison problem; it's a broader regulatory state problem. He's just a perfect encapsulation of the regulatory state politician. Yeah, I mean, and he's kind of he's kind of right that the regulatory state politician doesn't hold the the hose, doesn't like hold the, the syringe. There is that kind of you know they're coordinating all these different agencies, as you were describing. They're not actually, you know, they don't see themselves as having that that control that responsibility that accountability yeah. and yeah i think it's an important point as well that like directly before covid you saw you know all these things were already there but one thing i did want to ask you about was you know okay you, you described the regulatory state and some of these pathologies um you know no capacity blurred lines of control and responsibility accountability is not good you know there might be <clears throat> not high levels of trust accordingly but the um the wf actually rated australia's pandemic preparedness as top five in the world i mean number four after only the us and the uk one and two and a a country another country at number three which i don't know so i shouldn't have laid out like that but certainly top five is is pretty good um how do you kind of square these things because presumably you know, if, if you're going to have uh, this regulatory state, that would mean bad pandemic preparedness. Or if you have good pandemic preparedness, that would mean a successful response. Like what 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 explains all of this? Well, firstly, we know that the WEF ranking, we're not all that because number one was the United States and number two was the UK. Um, and we know that the response to COVID in both countries was pretty pretty terrible really um and um are you also, you're questioning the wef <laughs> i think i am i mean i don't know what the consequences are going to be hopefully uh nothing too serious mm-hmm. but um yes <laughs> um we know that the uk and the, and the us did really badly we know that uh, the capacities were only on paper but not in reality um and what we say in the book um is that the reason why these countries were ranked so high is because they had bureaucrats and, and, and others that were really good at ticking the right boxes in order to push themselves up in the ranking um, of exercises like the WEF, because the, it's not like the WEF sends people to uh, the United States or the UK and really inspects the capacities for pandemic preparedness. They look for the existence of certain kinds of plans. Uh, they try to see, for instance, uh, what public health capacities are notionally there, like what what uh, offices are are available, you know, what clinics are there, what uh, lab capacity, and so on. Uh, but by, by and large, it's an exercise that is designed to show that the people within a particular country have a plan for addressing a pandemic that is broadly yeah. in line with the global expectations. Um, it's so evaluating it's PowerPoint presentations rather than yeah, actually yeah, kind yeah. of inspecting the material kind of capacities. Do you have a lot of middle managers? Yes. Yeah, yeah you do. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that anyone who's looked at pandemic planning in any country would have seen is that the plans themselves, um, including in countries that failed miserably to implement them, uh, were very elaborate and on paper looked quite sophisticated and, and impressive. Um, sometimes you have all these arrows going in a variety of different directions. Um, it's very rare to see hierarchical structures anymore. So these days it's usually, you know, various, uh, circles, uh, Venn diagrams <laughs> merging into each other and, and arrows going in different directions and so on. Um, so on paper, some of that stuff looks quite impressive. Uh, and Australia had many pandemic plans. Uh, in fact, um, there was a, a paper written in 2012, so a very long time before the COVID-19 pandemic, that described Australia's abundance of plans as a plandemic. And this is not in the way that uh, people uh, who are conspiracy theorists would, would use the term, but they certainly use the term plandemic to refer to the fact that Australia had something like 18 different plans uh, for pandemic management. Um, and each one of those plans, so you have obviously the federal plans and you have the state plans, um, and, and hmm. there are multiple of those as well. And then you had different in- indexes and, and different uh, best practice sort of manuals and things like that. So there are many, many, many different plans. Um, well, that, that's that's quite striking in and of itself that almost like the more plans, the better. But actually, you know, I think one of the things that comes through in, in the book is 
in some ways, the fewer plans, the better in terms of having, you know, there is another response where things could be more, I guess, more concentrated or more centralized, <clears throat> which, you know, that that could partly explain the how the regulatory state sees um, preparedness is like the more, you know, 18 plans. What What could be better than that? Well, 19 plans. But actually, maybe this having all of these different plans simultaneously leads to exactly the sort of buck passing and kind of murky accountability lines which um which is what ended up happening yeah so there was an attempt right to to try and coordinate all these different plans it's not as though no one's ever tried or thought about the fact that they need to speak to each other uh but that was done in a very regulatory state manner as well so basically the the approach that was in line with the who's international health regulations which australia signed up to was uh, we're not going to close borders. We're not going to do I mean, lockdown. I don't think was even in anyone's basic menu. I, I don't think it was even um, you know on on the table at all. But no closed borders. We're not going to do that. Um, so essentially, what we're going to do is do our best to test, trace, and isolate people who have whatever infectious disease we're talking about. Um, and there was a federal plan, uh, a number of those, but th- there were plans that basically laid out the standards. And the basic guidelines and then other plans, state, state-based state plans, because the states are the one that run the real health systems in this country. It's not the federal government. Um, a state politician once told me that the federal government can't deliver a pizza. Uh, he was joking, but uh, essentially the, uh, it's, it's, the, um, it's the state that deliver health services in this country by and large. Um, so the federal government had this plan. Um, and it laid out the basic guidelines along along the lines of what I was just describing. And it didn't do much else. So it, it in this country, the federal government is the one that has the money. There is a situation here where they collect almost all the revenue, but they don't actually do as much as the states do. So that's a perennial problem between the federal government and the states. Um, but the federal government, when it came to uh, pandemic preparedness, essentially what they did is they created this national medical stockpile which was meant to stockpile emergency supplies of various things, including uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, which became a big deal, as many people would know during the pandemic. Um, now, that national medical stockpile was severely underfunded before the pandemic. Its entire stock was worth $120 million. The government then spent $2 billion in three months um, to, to, re- to, to build up those supplies. So it was severely under, um, undersupplied. Um, and it also ran and funded two national drills. And the last drill was in 2008. So basically, the federal government created this process, gave everyone else the guidelines and didn't do much else. Mm. The state, meanwhile, was squeezed in a variety of different ways because the federal government, roughly at the same time, which is post-GFC, was also practicing austerity, which, again, would be familiar to um, uh, to people from, uh, from around the world, uh, certainly in Britain. Um, and it tried to impose the burden of austerity on the states. This is the beauty of federal politics, um, and it had yeah. the capacity to do that uh, because the fact that it's got its hand on on, on the tiller, basically. So it, it was able to um, to try and pass on the cost, and states were just saying, look, I mean, we've got a lot of different things we need to be doing because they run public hospitals and a, a variety of different things like that, and, and they cut a lot of capacity there as well, but they're really underinvested in public health. They're basically just almost stopped doing public health uh, because of, of those cuts. So um, essentially that's the kind of context in, in, the, in, in the early days of the pandemic. And then many people, maybe they try not to remember, but maybe would remember that kind of sense of, of, of panic and disbelief that uh, accompanied the early stages of the pandemic, right? Um, around sort of late February, March, 2020. So, from this context, you get into a situation where, uh, firstly, China locks down, so that creates lockdown as a as a potential policy option. Then Italy locks down. When Italy locks down, uh, uh, screens are saturated here with images of uh, people in Italy dying in the corridors. Very distressing images, obviously, of people dying in hospital corridors. Um, and Italy, that experience. Uh, and then Italy locks down as well. But that experience really resonated in Australia. It, it really uh, had a massive impact on, on the public. Um, and and pa- panic is beginning to rise. I mean, all over the country, uh, people are essentially beginning to pull back from 
living in society long before lockdown was introduced. And I think it's really important to say that yeah. it's a point that Adam Tooze actually made in his book, Shutdown. Um, and I think it's a point that's missed by many of the critics of lockdown that shutdown came before lockdown. Shutdown is the phenomenon of people pulling back, um, stopping uh, the kids from going to school, not going to work. There's very strong data on this from Australia that actually shows that, for instance, in the CBD, central business districts of Melbourne and Sydney, the two biggest cities in the country, foot traffic and all traffic basically declined by 85% before lockdown was introduced. Um, and when lockdown was introduced, it basically stabilized. So they're just the essential workers, just the people that had to go. But other people stopped doing it already. So you get this combination of the shutdown, the panic, the panic buying, and yeah. you get governments beginning to panic that they may not have the capacity to actually manage this pandemic. And the scenes from Italy, again, were very distressing. We now know that the health system there was especially run down, even much worse than the one in Australia. And at that point, basically, the plans go out the window, right? That, that's the yeah. moment where all these beautiful plans literally just thrown out the window at that point. Um, and for the rest of the pandemic, the plans were completely meaningless. So what happens then? So that, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the situation very early on, right? Where you, yeah, exactly as you described it, the, the shutdown, the response um, that, you know, the regulatory state took was partly conditioned by what citizens were already doing and partly by those. Yeah. But I think it was particularly important that, that um, lockdown in Italy, that kind of, you know, pa paved the way to a certain extent. Um, but what, one thing which I think it would be useful to just go through and there's a, there's a, um, a chapter on the, the failures of hotel quarantining in, um, in Australia, which is titled the grand bungle fest hotel. Um, and elsewhere in the book, you are quite keen, seemingly, on people taking responsibility for decisions. So I did want to ask the two of you, <clears throat> who's going to take responsibility for this quote unquote pun and uh, what form will this responsibility take? Well, George, you mentioned people in glass houses, I think, earlier um, and uh, b b before we started recording. And mm -hmm. uh, given the puns that you've been dishing out on this podcast for a long time, I don't think you're in a position to... Uh, to say "quote unquote" puns, a pun is a pun. Okay. I think uh, each pun deserves to be respected for its punness. Um, Fair dues. But but I, I, I gladly take responsibility for this pun. Um, I've always been uh, not always, but certainly uh, in in my younger days, I was really keen to become a headline writer for the Sun or a similar newspaper. And and I think we finally got the chance to do it with this book. You know, we finally got a chance to unleash that kind of. Uh, inner sort of um, co-editor that's that exists in each one of us yeah no I mean you've got to give it a go I guess um, that is important that's it's the only way that you can develop into a true punster is by you know you don't you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take so So moving on to um, lockdown itself, um, which obviously central to the to the book, the title of the book and, and the argument. So you you do claim at in one point at one point in the book that ninety percent of the world's population at some time or other was locked down. So could you just be you know could you give us um, a definition of what this lockdown means? Because obviously different policies in different parts um, of the world, and yeah, what 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 does this mean? This term lockdown. Yes, I mean, that, that statistics comes from the Oxford Britannic uh, School of Government and their COVID stringency index, which uh, basically measures the severity of a number of policies around the world um, it, around restrictions on gatherings and movement, um, closing work um, workplaces, schools, borders, and so on. So it's quite a convoluted um, uh, index um, and sort of takes in a lot of things and spits out a number that says, you know, anything above 70 mm -hmm. is considered a lockdown. And at one point, they thought that you know, about 90% of people in the world had experienced some of those those, uh, those restrictions. 
Um, for us, lockdown is, I guess, a bit more simpler um, and sort of, you know, a, a more straightforward definition where basically we defined it as a situation where government orders residents and people stay at home, except when they are engaged in a number of set essential activities and where failure to comply with that order carries a penalty, um, usually mm. a fine of some sort of sort. Um, and so, so yeah. Australia had 40, 40 of these as lockdowns as you define it four zero between march 2020 and january 2022 um but australians liked them right i mean this is uh, against what what the four of us personally might might feel um what why what what explains this kind of apparent support for um these lockdowns which in some cases were quite severe yeah, they're very popular. I mean, even now, most people don't think that there was anything particularly problematic. And resistance to lockdown in this country was a fringe movement. It never became mainstream in mm. any way. And no one's managed to capitalize politically on on lockdowns in this country, uh, on resistance to lockdown, yeah. that is. Um, so there are elements of, of the explanation that resonate with what happened in other countries and there are elements that are uniquely Australian. So the element that resonates with what happened in other countries is the fact that as I mentioned before, there was this kind of shutdown thing. Everyone was staying home anyway. Um, so it, it was seen as governments finally doing what people kind of wanted them to do. People wanted them to to, to, to take those decisions, to uh, make them stay at home because they're staying home anyway. So there was this enormously dangerous virus coming from the outside and governments were acting, um, doing their bit. Uh, but what what's unique about the Australian... And, and, and that, in, me, in most countries, when that happened that didn't last that long, that support, at least among certain parts of the public. But in Australia, what yeah. happened, which is unusual, is the fact that that initial lockdown uh, and the closed borders, which you mentioned before, actually worked to everyone's surprise. Uh, no one expected the virus to be eliminated, but the virus was eliminated. And that, as, as Tom mentioned previously, allowed most people in this country, most of the time, at least right up until the second part of 2021, to live relatively normal lives in this country. And that changed the politics of lockdown and closed borders for good right up until the end of the pandemic and maybe beyond, uh, because it gave legitimacy to these measures that perhaps was not found in other countries, because in a sense, they worked, they achieved what they're meant to achieve. Um, so basically, um, and, and uh, you know, initially, the, the virus was eliminated everywhere else, and then it came back in Melbourne, and then somehow Melbourne surprisingly managed to eliminate the virus again after being locked down for four months. And at that point, the narrative became, these things work if we try hard enough. Melbourne tried really, really hard. They eliminated it again. Um, and that became the story, and, and that was perpetuated uh, increasingly both by governments, which were initially not that keen on lockdowns, but they became keen on lockdowns because in part it was popular um, and, and also because that's what, um, you know, the kind of public message as well that was coming from the media from many experts at the time was that that is what needs to happen in order to address this virus. And because it worked at a certain point, the story became, well, if we just tried hard enough, it will work every time. And right. that gave these measures a legitimacy that I don't think it got in other parts of the world. And the story became that if we don't do it, the alternative is catastrophe. And we talk a little bit about the psychology of it because there's a lot of research in psychology that uh, talks about cognitive dissonance. And the, the idea is that if you got hazed very badly to be a member of a particular club, you're likely to attach a greater significance to be a member of that club than if people just let you in. If you sacrifice a lot for something to happen you think it's really important. And people did sacrifice enormously in order to um, achieve this zero COVID, right? Um, it, it was, you know, in many places and certainly in Melbourne, it was a big sacrifice. So people came to believe that nothing was more important than zero COVID. doesn't matter whatever happens. And the, and the tools for achieving that became lockdowns and closed borders. So that's one part of the explanation, which is, in a sense, unique to, uh, not, not unique to Australia, but unique to a very small number of countries that managed to eliminate community transmission of, of the virus. And the other part, which I'm not going to get into too much detail about, because I'm sure that you talked about that a lot on the podcast, is the fact that the social consequences, and this is not unique to Australia, the social consequences of lockdown were not distributed evenly. The people who are better off in society generally did okay under lockdown and in many cases got a lot wealthier as well. 
many companies also learned to love lockdowns because they were doing very well. And, and certainly in Australia, there's a long history of um, business which is kind of benefiting from government largesse in a variety of different ways. I know in the UK as well, through government contracts and services and so on. And a lot of them were doing very well indeed. Um, so lockdown became, in that context, a niche pursuit. And um, there was no one in the media really that was... Um, you know, beating the drum of, of anti-lockdown, unlike maybe in some countries where at least these voices were around. Um, and on the, so on that, the country, in a sense, explains you, the uh, yeah. popularity of it. And yeah, as you say in the book, it also, you know, it made some people's media careers by being very pro zero COVID, very disastrous, very, you know, if you're going to proclaim a catastrophe, it's not, you know, not necessarily bad for um, your kind of appearances on on national news networks. Um, mm. One thing that we haven't really talked about, and you know, I definitely would suggest listeners pick up the book to to read more about this. Is the as I mentioned this um, this greatly titled chapter on hotel quarantine. These hotel kind of quarantine approach being important because there, as we just <laughs> talked about, there was originally no plan to kind of close international borders. So, you know, this this <laughs> when that did happen, um, there was a, a whole set of you know, regulatory state failures around hotel quarantine and also the vaccine rollout. As Tom mentioned earlier, this was um, slow, the, the stroll out of the, the vaccine, which showed, again, the, the regulatory state couldn't procure properly, re- relied on consultancies and had no leverage over private providers um, because they'd, you know, entirely exhausted their own capacity and needed to bring in the um, Australian Defence Force to to kind of see things um over the line but kind of bringing all of this together the you know we've kind of talked about here are some plans as soon as they meet reality there seem to be illusory or very you know but probably very well designed powerpoints but actually not you know this kind of coordination of all these different things doesn't lead to the sort of um state response that would be necessary to to manage this sort of um situation and you know and all the other problems that um you know preceded covid um that were dealt with in a not particularly impressive way what do you think then about next time i guess this is what i'm trying to segue towards um yeah because you conclude by asking whether it's going to be you know different next time um when there's another kind of state of emergency that the regulatory state in australia finds itself in um what is your kind of, not that you have a solution, but you do talk about the need to have authoritative rather than an authoritarian states. Like what's the difference between these two terms? Why does this matter? Why is it? Cause this is like not necessarily better planning or like more state capacity straightforwardly. It seems like it's a different sort of answer. So could you talk us through that a little bit? Sure. Happy to. So I think, you know, credit where credit is due. Uh, that term authoritative, authoritative rather than authoritarian comes from an article that Shahar wrote, a friend of the show, Lee Jones, about Britain and COVID. Um, that sort of kicked off Shahar's and I's interest in doing something similar in Australia. And they, they introduced this notion of a state that needed to be authoritative rather than authoritarian. Um, and But we develop a bit more in the book to try to think through what that would mean, you know, within obviously the limits of a conclusion, where we're just sort of thinking of what, you know, what should be done uh, we did use a quote from Lenin there at one point, but they got cut out in edits, so not it seems on like everyone is a fan of Lenin. Um, but when we talk about the author, uh, authoritative rather than authoritarian state, um, what we're trying to say is that you know we need a fundamental reform of governance. We need a fundamental reform of the state and its core logics and core functions if we are to if the next crisis is is, is going to go differently. Because otherwise, um, you know, we sort of, you know, we show how similar pathologies, similar problems persist in other other areas of governance. So, you know, as we said earlier, we might not get as lucky next time. And I think the the, the authoritative state encompasses two key, key aspects that I think are important. Um, the first one is a massive investment in capacity. So basically, you know, one of the reasons we did so badly is because there was no capacity within the state. You know, as I said mentioned earlier, when leaders went to pull a lever, there was nothing there attached to it. You know, they couldn't just roll out the vaccine. They couldn't just spring up quarantine facilities into be, um, you know, mm-hmm. into being when they were necessary. Um, you know, the ca- hospital capacity wasn't there. ICU beds were not there. The na- national medical stockpile that Shahar mentioned wasn't there. There was just no capacity behind the facade of plans and preparedness and so on. So I think 
perhaps one of the, the, the first things we need to do if we are to have a different crisis next time is a massive investment capacity with the state actually taking responsibility for providing public services and public goods, not just outsourcing them to private providers, not just bringing the consultants in to tell them what to do or how to do it, not just marketizing um, um, social services as, as is a very big trend in Australia, but actually being prepared to provide them itself, being prepared to build up you know, quarantine facilities, being prepared to invest money into the health system, both in its people and its in, uh, infrastructure and machinery and so on. Um, so that I think if, if we are, if next time about to, has to be, is to be different, then we need to actually a massive investment in capacity. But that's in itself, you know, that can go down a pretty dangerous route very easily where the state just sort of takes over everything. And that's the not authoritarian part that mm-hmm. we are concerned about. You know, we don't, we don't just want a strong state for the sake of the strong state. We don't want a state that just will tell us, um, you know, we'll, we'll do everything and tell us what to do. Uh, because we had that during COVID, and that wasn't necessarily a good experience. So we're not, we're not calling for, we're not calling for unchecked power. We're also calling for building up of political and institutional ties between the state and society, rebuilding those ties which got dismantled during the regulatory state period. In fact, that was the whole point of the regulatory state, as Shahar was saying earlier. It was to remove the state from um, from a relate, direct relationship with society. If the state is to be authoritative and if the state is to be accountable then those ties have to be rebuilt um the state has to be responsive to people has to implement people's wishes rather than just being the sort of the be all and end all that knows what to do um and it has to be able to mobilize population during a crisis you know it has to be able to call on people to um you know to to be mobilized in in favor of a social goal uh whatever whatever that is just 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 to jump in here quickly the so when you say to mobilize people around a social goal like what what does this look like because one one way to read lockdowns is that this is a massive demobilization but what what would a you know even either in a covid context or another context what would that mobilization look like well i mean one of the things that's discussed in australia for example is around disaster emergency management you know we are with climate change australia has become Mm -hmm. much more prone to disasters uh both you know floods fires um, and so on. So it's about having, you know, having the population being there, being prepared to, you know, to, to help out in their communities when they strike together with the state, not just relying on people to, you know, go and pick up uh, citizens st- stranded on rooftops on their own volition or because someone told them to go there on Facebook, but working hand in hand with state agencies um, to implement these disaster, the disaster response plans, for example. Um, I think, you know, during COVID, occasionally we saw um, you know, we, we saw the state um, being startled by the population wanting to do things like set up food banks or set up sort of community support groups. Um, and the state right. was actually like, no, 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 go back to your homes, go back to lockdown, demobilize. Um, but that's only just turned people further off from feeling like they had a state in the state and the state policy response. Um, what we'll be, what we'll be hoping for will be the opposite of, that, of, of the state, knowing that the population is there and ready to act behind whatever you know, whatever plan we decide. But that plan has to be debated. That plan has to be democratically uh, agreed on, um, so that people feel like they have a stake in it. Mm-hmm. So this this I guess takes us to um, our final question, which is: What would you say to those who would dismiss the Australian experience as unrepresentative? What are the wider lessons for those outside of Australia? that they could take from um, from your con- the conclusions of your study? Well, probably the first one would be that luck is a great thing, right? I mean, initially, um, <laughs> the response yeah. that other countries pursued um, was exactly replicated here, pretty much, but led to very different outcomes. And a lot of that was about luck. Um, but uh, a bit less facetiously, um, I would say that first thing is that Australia was seen as a success story. Um, And I think it's important to dig into, if you are thinking of Australia as a success story, dig into what quote unquote made it a success. Um, And as we, as we talked about um, on this podcast and we show in the book, um, it was largely about luck. It's just the kind of things that happened here that um, may not have happened in other places because this is an Island at the far end of the world. Um, People come here, either by plane, usually by plane, rarely by boat. It's very easy to close borders, uh, unlike in many other parts of the world. 80% of the cases Mm -hmm. here at the time of lockdown were imported. 
that's not the case in many countries. I mean, if you if you did the same, uh, and Australia was not the first country to lock down, far from it. Um, um, for memory, I think it locked down even after the UK. Um, so it's not as though, um, you know, we had some kind of unusual foresight and we implemented it long before everybody else. We followed what other countries were doing, yeah. but we just got lucky. Yeah. So I think that's important to understand. Um, and people can take that away because it, it tells you something also about the quality of the responses themselves. You know, I mean, can they actually work what Australia did? Can they work elsewhere? Well, probably not. Will it work here next time? Probably not. Okay, that's quite important. The other thing that people should pay attention to, um, if you've been listening to the podcast, you would have heard that actually a lot of what I was telling you about Australia's recent history is very similar to British recent history, to European recent history, to North American, uh, US, Canada recent history. Um, we traveled along a very similar path. Um, as, as we talked about in the other podcast, there was a bit of luck involved that again made Australia a bit less prone to some of the problems that exist in other countries, but it's a very similar path. So the kinds of pathologies that we're describing here are actually quite common to all of these countries that we mentioned. Um, and therefore, um, if people are trying to understand what happened in those countries, they also need to think about it in very similar terms, in, in my view. Tom, you, you wanted to uh, jump in? Yeah, you wanted to come in, Tom. Yeah, I think, you know, I think uh, I'm sure at some point in the podcast, we've, you've talked about, you know, Peter Mayer's concept of the void between the people and, and politicians and sort of how one of the key aspects of neoliberalism has been the emergence of this, this divide between the people and, and, and their representatives. And, you know, the regulatory state is literally the creature of that void. It is the embodiment of that void of a state that tries to escape Mm -hmm. you know, abolish the people and escape from them. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the regulatory state concept is not something that we thought up. It is, it is a concept in the literature that we use to analyze Australia, but, you know, that Lee and Shaha um, used to analyze Britain and could be, could be used to analyze most Western countries that have gone through the sort of neoliberal, uh, neoliberal process. So I think that the, the problems they were identified with the regulatory state, both that sort of the governance problems, you know, the capacity problems, but also the political problems, are very much present in in around the world. So if we want to think about you know, what is the relevance of Australia's story to those countries, is that, well, actually, a lot of these problems are your problems too. Um, you know, and we, we, we try to show in the book how those problems play out in the, in the moment of crisis. And, you know, given that we've got, we seem to be going from crisis to crisis, from, from you know, perma-crisis to poly-crisis, maybe that's, there's some useful insights there for, for other parts of the world who will be facing similar issues in, in the future. And if they want to overcome those problems, then they're going to have to find a way to bridge that void, to overcome that void, um, and actually make the state, as we say, authoritative but not authoritarian. So I think hopefully, if mm. listeners can take anything away from the book, it will be maybe just the relevance of that argument to their own context. Yeah, it's one the of final those. Thing, like, George, if I may, that yeah. I wanted to say about the book and about the lessons for the rest of the world is that. Given what we just said, it's probably clear by now that we actually care deeply uh, about the relationship between the Australian state and us, you know, we live here. Um, so we wrote the book really in a moment of crisis, uh, facing significant personal difficulties, especially Tom in, in, in Melbourne, really to try and actually open this up for conversation within Australia in particular. I mean, if, if other people around the world read this and learn something, that'd be great. But our main focus was actually to, to speak to our fellow citizens in this country and say, look, this is the country in which you live. This is why really bad things just happen to you. We need to think about that and we need to try and work out, you know, is that the country we want to live in the future? And, and, if, and if it's not the country we want to live in the future, we need to actually act and do something about this. Um, so that was really, I think, mm. the strongest uh, motivator for, for writing this book. You know, it's, it's to try and reach out to people around us. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, a great place to leave it because that's a question that Indeed, you know, we, yeah. we should uh, probably all ask, you know, although that is a question you pose in the Australian context, it's probably one we can all pose where, wherever we happen to live. So, yeah, thank you so much, Tom and Shahar, for coming back on the podcast. Thanks, a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks very much. much.